Next piece in line is the worm gear, number 26. This is 3 16 inch diameter brass. That's 4.75 millimeter diameter. And it's about 20 millimeters long. And it's the final element to control the elevator mechanism that will raise and lower the table on this old drill press. Stick a piece of material in the collet. Let's get to it. This is a 20 TPI helix on here. Uh, basically a thread, but instead of being a 60 degree imperial profile thread, it is a 40 degree. Very shallow. Let's do it. Using a thin piece of paper held lightly between two fingers is a very good way to get a cutter close to the surface of your material. Once it starts to shred like it did or it pulls it completely out of your fingers, you know you're close. Now only after I shot this segment did I realize what I had done. This part, if you will watch how it rotates between flats, it is rotating counterclockwise. That means any burrs formed by that pass right there are still intact when the next pass is formed. The more efficient, safer, and cleaner way to do this would be to rotate that part clockwise. That way any shelf burrs that were formed will be removed by the next pass. I hope that's easy to visualize. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment line. Rotate it clockwise, we'll remove the burrs. And instead of going four times, go five times just to be sure. This feature is the small spud on the end of the worm gear that positions the worm gear correctly. Now if you break the edge of this little cylindrical feature or drill the hole in the casting too deep, you will have a problem. And I will illustrate that problem later in this video. Try to stick to the numbers here, hit it as close as you can, and if you have to break this edge, that's fine. I think you're going to like the fix that I present.
The sliding features are going to be done on the mini fixture plate. I have stop clamps here to keep it from rotating and one clamp here to keep it held down. It is located true to the fixture plate so it will be true to the vise once I put it in. Everything is accessible. The splits are on the same center line so that's going to work out rather well and I can drill and tap everything from one side. Let's put it in the machine. Knock out this final feature. Locating the edge of a slitting saw or the center of your feature is no big deal. Place a pin in the hole that you want to split. Bring the saw down till it makes contact with the pin. At this point, lower the saw or raise the table half the thickness of the blade. From that point, you can dial in whatever center line you require. Done correctly, the front and rear splits on this little casting should be in the same spot, ideally. Now let's see what happens. I plant the conventional cut through this part for sake of uh, safety. I do not want to see this part shift. If it grabs, it'll only kick away as opposed to pull it into the cutter and blow it up. Rotation on this casting is restricted by the two blocks on the end. Downward force is a single clamp. And if you're wondering about the nature of this saw, it is a rather unique looking blade. It looks more like a wood blade than a steel or aluminum blade. This is an 032 slitting saw. That's about 0.8 millimeters. Don't quote me on that. And it was completely wiped out. So by creative grinding around the outside, actually on a pedestal grinder, I salvaged that saw and made this one. Works just fine. Let's do the front. That is the completed part, 100%. Split, drilled, tapped, done. If you attempt this model, learn from what I've done, and I would say make these holes at least a thousandth and a half oversized from the part that's going to go in there. Now you naturally control both of the stems, you know, the column and the bottom of the table. So if it doesn't fit together, then by all means size something. But I did experience some movement in this after I split it. I was quite surprised at that. The holes did close up. Let's take a look at the pros and cons of this subassembly. And I got to say, if there's anybody listening from the company, you might want to take note of this particular incident. The pivot hole for the bottom of the worm gear. You can see how the diameter of the worm gear is bigger. Then the center to center distance from the rack to where this particular gear inserts. That means if this seats, 
the OD of this gear is going to encounter that rack. So a small locator boss on here or a shim underneath this is absolutely required in order to get this to work. If that particular hole right there is drilled at or deeper than called out on the print, then they will hit. There's no question about that. To overcome that problem on this particular model, ta-da, Delrin bushing once again. Anything that pivots is going to get a Delrin bushing. Got one in the pocket. One in the pocket. I keep banging on that camera. All right, here we go. And one on the top. So I'm going to do the cap once before. So when they do go together at this point, there is minimal end play on that. Sorry about the dark. You can't, can't help that. There's about three thousandths worth of end play in this particular cover. I'll take that back off for a second. Let's see what's going on. I'm going to use a gauge pin instead of the actual pin for the gear that goes in here. I'll drop it down in there and seat it right. And put it together. Give me a second to drive those screws in. Be right back. And the final piece of this particular subassembly is the crank. I'm going to try to do this and not block the camera. Good luck with that. And a closing look at the progress so far. The knee is complete, the crank mechanism is complete, all the gears on the inside are complete, lower cone pulley and outer drive pulley are complete, the base is complete. Uh, next thing to do would be the table right there. The table starts off looking like this. If you watch the mini lay series, you've seen me make a table like that. It's, it was the faceplate for that particular machine. But so far, so good. This is coming out real nice. I am very pleased. One of the pieces required to complete the drill press table area is the table itself. Now, there are no through holes in this like there were in the face plate on the lathe. So in order to clock this, you have to come up with some way to find these ribs. Because if you put the slots in before the ribs go in, or, or excuse me, if you put the slots in out of clocking, with the casting ribs, they're going to pop through the back of the plate. So you absolutely must find it. And yes, there is a deburring witness mark right there on all four for anybody that's going to comment and rag on me. I'm going to beat you to it. What I did here was I popped a hole in the middle of a fixture plate. And these little guys, hang on a second. These little pins right here will sit in these holes. Doing this with one hand is just not happening. There we go. Keeping those holes, the pins, proud of the surface of the plate when you install the face plate itself or the table itself into that hole. The hole is bigger than the stem. This can float around and bump up against these two pins. Once you know that it's clocked correctly, you no longer have to look for it. All you have to do is indicate the center hole or the OD of this part, and off you go. It worked out very well, and you can do this a couple of different ways. I did it on my fixture plate, oriented to the back of the plate with the tool bit. And if I can find that same tool bit, I'll show you. There we go. And once the part sat on there, the pins were true to the plate, the plate was true to the world, the plate went in the vise, sharks in the water, you go in the water, sharks eat you. So that's 
line from Joe is one of my favorites. Anyway, that's how it's done. Let's throw the table on the fixture and mill it out. With the part securely in the fixture, locating from the center bore, we're just going to sweep the pin to make sure that everything is true and get on with the sliding. Using a two flute high speed steel end mill, 075 diameter. These passes are about 0.6 millimeters deep each, about 22, 25 thousandths of an inch deep each. Make several passes to get to the bottom uh, depth of 0.13. And when I get there, I'm going to walk the cutter off two thousandths in each direction to climb mill the sides of the slot and establish the depth. Times four. Three-eighths diameter, four flute, 90 degree chamfer tool. This is carbide. And I'm just gonna lower it down into the slot, repeating the exact same trajectory that I used for the cutter that formed the slots. And it should give me a nice break edge on the straight and round features of that slot. It's just easier than filing it. Using an extremely small T-slot cutter, the next step in the process to finish this table is to turn these vertical slots into regular slots. And like I said before, my philosophy is to make the center slot 5 thousandths deeper than the sides. It takes a lot of the stress off the tool and makes for an easier cut. When using a delicate T-slot cutter like this, stay tangent to the end of the slot to reduce the risk of breaking the cutter. Successfully milled. You can see that the center channel is slightly deeper than the T-profile. And I also went around the top with a 45 degree tool to give the slots a nice edge. And in keeping with the philosophy of no mating parts without a bushing, there you go. Let's put this on the semi-assembled drill press and take a look at how it looks. with pushing yep there we go nothing is secure at this point of course the knee is not tight to the column the column is not tight to the base the table is not secured in place At assembly, there is a very long cap screw that goes through the bottom of this, through the center of the column, and into the upper frame. And that ties everything together. It also keeps this from rotating when you only want the knee to rotate. That is all I got. Appreciate you tuning in. Thank you very much for watching. Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out. If anyone out there actually has this kit and you are building it right now or plan to build it and want to know exactly what I did with that shaft right there, leave me a comment in the comment section of this video and we'll figure out a way to get those details to you.
And if I had any suggestions whatsoever for anybody that is going to build this, when you make this little worm gear right here that this crank is connected to, make it a left-hand thread. Currently called out and constructed, machined, assembled as a right hand. And when you turn this crank clockwise, the table goes down. I don't know about all you guys with your mini mills, but on a conventional mill in a machine shop, when you turn the handle clockwise, the table goes up. So if you want it to feel like a real machine in your hands, do it that way. Make that helix a left hand and it should perform perfectly.